Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Today, we're doing a special study of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, in Hebrew, it's sukkot, which means booths and temporary dwellings. Um, let's talk about the feasts. Three times a year, all the Jews were to go before the Lord to keep the feasts. And there's an interesting little point here that, yes, we worship God at home, but God also wants us to get out and go to church, uh, get together with God's people and gather together to worship. And that's what the Jews did, uh, especially for these three times a year. These feasts describe God's redemptive program and they are prophecies of Jesus. And he fulfilled all the feasts right on time. You know, God keeps his appointments on time. There are two Hebrew words for feasts. The first one is moedim, which means appointed times. Uh, and Secondly, mikra, or holy convocations, holy gatherings, or we could say dress rehearsals. These were prophetic dress rehearsals at appointed times that Messiah will fulfill right on time. And, and I want to just very quickly recap the first feasts. There are the first spring feasts in the first month, which actually were prophetic of Messiah's first coming. First of all, Passover. Actually, on the 10th day of the month, the, la the Passover lamb was set aside and was sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan. And this is a picture of Christ. In fact, he was set aside four days before in his triumphal entry. He was, as it were, presented to the leaders of Israel. They examined him, and he was set aside for death. And then he died as the Passover lambs were being killed in the temple. Jesus was being crucified as our Passover lamb. And uh, praise God. Uh, and then the next feast was the, on the 15th, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Actually, at the end of the 14th, all the, the Jews were removing all the leaven from their house. Leaven represents sin. And by, why? Because from the 15th onwards, uh, the, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they could only eat unleavened bread. Um, and this, is, this removal of the leaven is a picture of Christ. What he did in the 15th when he was buried, he removed our sin. He took away the sins of the world. And then the next day, the 16th of Nisan, was the Feast of First Fruits. On the Sunday, always on the Sunday, the third day, the first fruits of the barley harvest were lifted up to God uh, to be accepted by God. And on that very same moment, as they were doing that, Jesus, our first fruits, the first fruits of the harvest uh, that we are going to be part of, the harvest, but Jesus was the first fruits, was raised and accepted by God on our behalf. And the, the harvest, first fruits being offered up and accepted, was the guarantee of the rest of the harvest. And so that guarantees our resurrection. Jesus, the first fruits of the harvest to come. So Jesus, you see, fulfilled all the feasts of the first month. And then 50 days later was the feast of Pentecost. In those 50 days, the, 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 the harvest of the grain, the barley and the wheat was gathered in. And once it was all gathered in, again, it was offered up to God at the feast of Pentecost. And uh, this represents the church age, the harvest of the church age. And it begins and ends, I believe, at Pentecost. We live in the Feast of Pentecost. We're all Pentecostals, whether we realize it or not. And, and so the Feast of the first month is what Jesus did in his first coming. The Feast there of Pentecost is, again, uh, being lifted up to God is the church age, finishing with the rapture. And, um, and then after that comes the summer months, which is when the various fruits of the land, the olives, the vine, the grapes, and so on, the figs, are harvested. And then comes the final feast in the seventh month, which is tabernacles. And tabernacles uh, is the, when the feast of ingathering, when all the fruits are gathered in, and there's a great time of rejoicing at the end of the agricultural year. And the first fruits of all those fruits were offered up to God. And so the first coming is in prefigured by the feasts of the first month, the second coming of Christ by the feasts of the second, seventh month, and with the church age in between. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering. Let's look at the first mention of the feast in Exodus 23. Three times you will keep a feast to me in the year, says the Lord. First, the feast, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then, 
and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you've sown in the field. That's Pentecost. And three, the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. And at the second coming of the Lord, uh, all the fruit of the earth, the remaining fruit of the earth from all generations will, will, will be uh, brought into the kingdom of God. Uh, praise God. Well, the ingathering, the final harvest feast when all had been gathered in. And so there was great rejoicing and thanking of God for the completed harvest because it was at the end of that agricultural year in the holiday time before they started the new year with the sowing and so on. They were also praying for the outpouring of rain for the next year so they would have a good harvest for the next year. The rain would start in October to soften the ground for the sowing. And uh, it says that it's at the end of the year. That signifies that tabernacles speaks of the fulfillment of God's purposes. What started at Passover comes to fulfillment at Tabernacles. It's a great time of rejoicing because it speaks of God's ultimate purpose uh, for history being fulfilled. What is it all about? Where is history going? What's God's plan for his people? This is what Tabernacles is speaking about. It's speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's speaking about the ingathering of the harvest of souls into God's kingdom at the end of the age. Um, it's a time of great rejoicing. Exodus 34 says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, that's Pentecost, and the Feast of the Engathering at the year's end. Well, it was a feast of great joy and thanksgiving for the harvest. Um, Israel was told to rejoice before God for seven days or eight days, giving thanks for his provision and, it, of, and his presence in the year. And so in Leviticus, it says, you will rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. It was total joy at Tabernacles. Uh, but it always happened after the Day of Atonement, five days before, because that was the day when atonement was made through a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. And only through atonement could they be under the mercy and the grace of God, so that God could be with them at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a picture, you see, that Israel will eventually fulfill the Feast of Atonement. They will repent for their sin. They will accept Christ and his atonement for them. And based on the atonement, they, are able, they will be able to enter into the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents God's presence and God's spirit with them. Well... It says in the Jewish literature that he who's not been to the Feast of Tabernacles and especially seen the water pouring ceremony, which is the Simkat Bet Ha Shoba, uh, which we'll talk about next time, uh, has not seen joy in this life. Such is the rejoicing. It was, also, it was called the, the feast, you know, if they were the feast. Uh, because that was the grandest of the feast, the most festive, the most sacrifices, the climactic feast. It was also the time of weddings, because this was when all the harvests were in, a few weeks of holiday there. It was later called the season of our rejoicing. And so you actually keep the feast by rejoicing. See the emphasis on rejoicing in Deuteronomy 16. You shall Observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you've gathered from your threshing floor and your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow who are in your gates. Notice everyone is commanded to rejoice. Whether you're poor or down and out, you, whatever troubles you have, you put that aside and you rejoice. Seven days you keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place where the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in your produce and in all the work of your hands that you will surely rejoice. Literally it is, you will have nothing but joy. And at that time, four species were waved before the Lord. It says, you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees. Nowadays, a citron is used that's a bit like a lemon. It's called an etrog. And that was, was used and waved before the Lord as thanksgiving for the fruit harvest. And they would also carry three branches of different trees bound together in what's called a lulav. There were, th first of all, branches of palm trees, uh, which is the big one in the middle. And then there were the boughs of leafy trees, which was now the myrtle branches, and then the willows of the brook.
and it says you shall rejoice with these holding these in your hand and waving them you will be rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days everyone goes round holding these branches and waves them in all six directions north south east west up and down and they were praying throughout the feast Hosanna save us now Lord and send prosperity and so these are used as symbols of prayer and thanksgiving. The willow, you see, only grows by water. So when it's lifted up, it's a prayer for rain and for the outpouring of the Spirit. The palm tree, as on all the coins of the time, represents nationalism, prayer for deliverance from enemies, prayer for, for self-rule, as it were. And that's why they waved palm trees at the triumphal entry of Jesus. They were saying, Hosanna, save us from the Romans. Ultimately, this is a prayer for the Messiah, that he would come and set them free from oppression and establish them as a free nation. And then the myrtle, which represents shalom, peace, prosperity. And again, it's a prayer for the Messiah to come and bring peace and joy and his spirit on the earth. And that's, they prayed this prayer, Lord, save us send prosperity and then they knew that this would only be fulfilled through the messiah because the next verse says blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord and so at this feast they were also looking beyond to the messiah and praying for the messiah to fulfill the feast at his return and that's why he will return at tabernacles because he's taught them to pray for his return at tabernacles and he will return and he will set them free from their enemies and he will pour his spirit out upon the earth and he will gather in the harvest of the earth at his return at tabernacles so both at his first coming and at his second coming uh, took place at tabernacles he was born at tabernacles and he will return again at tabernacles and so also at Tabernacles, they would build a sukkah, a booth. That's called the Feast of Booths, uh, a temporary dwelling place where, that they would live in during this time, during the feast. And in Leviticus, it says this, on the 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And the first day, a holy convocation. You'll do no customary work on it. For seven days, you will offer an offering to, made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you will have a holy convocation. It's a sacred assembly and so forth. So the feast is for seven days, but there's also a special eighth day mentioned as well. Not part of tabernacles, but connected to it, following it, a day of rest and rejoicing. The last special feast day in the year. And this has to be a picture of eternity when all the feasts are, have been completely fulfilled through Christ. It goes on to say in verse 39, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you will keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, a Sabbath rest. On the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It will be a statute forever in your generations. You will celebrate it in the seventh month. And then it says, you will dwell in booths, temporary huts, for seven days. All who are Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I'm the Lord your God. So they made booths to live and eat in for seven days. The roofs could not be perfect. There had to be holes in them to see the stars and to feel the rain. They were to remember the wandering in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt, when they didn't have houses, but when they lived in tents. And especially they were to remember that God dwelt in their midst, in his tent, the tabernacle. They saw his glory, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And the meaning of tabernacles, you see, is God dwelling with his people in the midst of his people. Because that's, God's, that's why it's the last feast. God's ultimate purpose is to dwell, to tabernacle with his people, in his people. That's why Jesus died for us at Passover, so that we can enter into tabernacles, that God with us and in us. He didn't just save us from, to save us from hell, but that we would be united with him together in loving communion, that we would know his glory and his spirit in us. God united with his people, in the midst of his people. That's what redemption's all about. And that's why it's a feast of great rejoicing. This is what it's all about in tabernacles, the presence and the glory of God with us and in us. And this is only possible through sacrifice. For example, at tabernacles, there were 70 oxen sacrificed, 13 the first day, 12 the next day, and so on. And Numbers 29, speaking of Christ's sacrifice for all nations, because the number of nations in Genesis 10 originally was reckoned to be 70.
And so it was particularly a time of prayer for the nations to know the God of Israel, a prayer for the harvest of the nations. It was a feast for the nations, as we see in Zechariah 14. The vision of tabernacles is that all nations would come and worship the Lord. And it's interesting, there are two stages in the fulfillment of tabernacles. The first one is living in a tabernacle, that's a temporary dwelling. And that's what Jesus did in his first coming. He tabernacled among us just for a short time. And that's why Jesus was born at tabernacles. You know, it says he, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He fulfilled tabernacles. If the first coming was pictured by the tabernacle, that temporary dwelling, the second coming is pictured by Solomon's temple. You see, the tabernacle and the temple represent the two comings of Christ and the two phases of our physical existence as temples of the Holy Spirit. Right now, our body is a tempt, a temporary dwelling of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, tabernacles is fulfilled in us if we're born again. But what is coming is not just a tent, but an eternal building. Our resurrection body is an eternal building that will last forever and ever. And that is like that, that permanent temple. And so God is in our present tabernacle, but he'll also be in our eternal temple. And Christ fulfilled tabernacles at his first coming with his birth in, in his tabernacle but also in his second coming in glory, when he will be in his eternal resurrection body, uh, shining with the glory of God. And so at each coming of Christ, he brings his people into the next fulfillment of the feast. Praise God. The tabernacle with the indwelling spirit represents us now in Christ, in our temporal bodies. But the temple of Solomon represents in us in our resurrection bodies. And it's interesting, you see, that Solomon's temple was dedicated at tabernacles because it was a tabernacles event. We see the united praise and thanksgiving of his people, and we see the temple filled with his glory. It says in Chronicles that all the men of Israel assembled with the king, Solomon, at the feast, which was in the seventh month. It says, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It was tabernacles time. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. You see, we live in a temporary tabernacle. But if we have accepted Christ, tabernacles is filled in us because we have the spirit, the glory of God within us, just as Israel had the God dwelling in their midst. So we can rejoice in that fulfillment of tabernacles. But there's a greater fulfillment of tabernacles coming because one day we'll receive our permanent resurrected bodies and the glory of God that's in our spirit will be fully released in through our whole being. And we will enter into the ultimate fulfillment of tabernacles that Solomon's temple spoke of. Now, Jesus fulfilled tabernacles. He was born at tabernacles in 2 B.C., John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh, that's his conception, and dwelt, or tabernacled, literally pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory. That's a tabernacles event. God with man and his glory revealed. God pitched his tent in our midst in the person of Jesus Christ. And as God pitched his tents in the midst of Israel and they saw his glory, so he pitched his tent among us in the body of Jesus. And we beheld his glory and his birth was a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. He had to be born on a feast day. Feasts are used for all the major divine appointments. And this was as major as you can get. John the Baptist was conceived after his father Zacharias had completed his week of service in the temple. He was part of the eighth out of 24 priestly courses that took their turn to minister in the temple. It's the course of Abijah in Luke 1.5. And so we can actually calculate the time of year when that happened. We also know that Jesus was conceived six months later than John at Hanukkah, so if we then add the 280 days of a perfect pregnancy, we get to tabernacles for Jesus' birth. So from John's birth, uh, conception, we can go forward to his birth, and then uh, plus the extra six months for Jesus, 
uh, we can calculate and confirm that Jesus was indeed born at Tabernacles. In Luke 2.8 it says, They were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now again, the time of Jesus' birth could not be winter because there's no way the sheep would be outside on the fields. It would be too cold. It couldn't be after November, November or after, on that account. But notice the shepherds had actually set up camp on the fields. Now they do this even to this day at a certain time of year, which is around the time of tabernacles. Because normally the sheep would not be allowed to graze on the fields, they would tread it down and spoil and eat the crop. But September, October time, when all the harvests were in, and before it was time for the plowing and the sowing in late October, the shepherds were welcomed by the farmers to camp out on the fields. The sheep, you see, could be helpful to clear the field, eating up remaining stubble from last year's crop and fertilizing the field. And so it was around the time of tabernacles when the angels appeared to the shepherds. And so his birth is a clear fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Another confirmation is that Jesus, we know, he lived 33 and a half years. 30 years to his baptism, he was baptized on his 30th birthday. And then he had a three and a half year ministry. So if you go exactly 33 and a half years from Tabernacles, you actually get to Passover in AD 33. And that's the very day that he would die on the cross. So it all fits together. Jesus was baptized at Tabernacles because it was on his 30th birthday. And again, his baptism is a clear Tabernacles event when the, he, his temple was dedicated to God for his mission and the Holy Spirit came on him. Just as the glory of God filled his temple at Tabernacles, just like Solomon's temple, you see. And, and we see that in Luke 3, 21. It says, Jesus also was baptized and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove on him. And the voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself, it says, began his ministry at about 30 years of age. But actually, this, the, this is in italics. The translator has, tried to, has added a meaning here. What it actually says is, literally, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Isn't that interesting? In other words, he was just turning 30. It was on the edge. He was entering into his 30th birthday when he was baptized. And even the word about that some people say, oh, he could have been 35, he could have been 40. No, this word about sounds like an, a very vague, number, but vague word. But actually, when it's used with numbers, it denotes precision. For example, in Acts 13 and 18, it says that Israel wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years. Well, actually, we know that they wandered in the wilderness exactly 40 years to the day. And the manna stopped exactly to the day of 40 years. So it's precision. It says there are about, in Acts 19, about 12 men who were baptized by Paul in Ephesus. But there were, of course, exactly 12 men. And so when it says about 30 years, it means he was exactly 30 years old. In other words, if he was born at Tabernacles, 2 BC, um, exactly 30 years later on his 30th birthday, it had to be Tabernacles again. And so we see how Jesus fulfills everything right on time. He fulfilled Passover on time by dying as our Passover lamb. He fulfilled unleavened bread in his burial by removing our sin from us uh, to the depths of the earth. And then he fulfilled first fruits by rising from the dead just as the first fruits was offered to the Lord. And then on the day of Pentecost, of course, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He poured out the Holy Spirit upon us. And uh, there is more things to happen on the day of Pentecost, I believe. And the feasts of the future will also be fulfilled on the day of atonement in the future. Israel will repent and they will see, who he, they will see him whom they pierced. They will see Christ through the eyes of faith that he, and they will mourn for him as for a firstborn son. They will realize that he is the son of God and they will accept him at the Day of Atonement, and then they will start to pray for him to return to save them. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus will return in power and glory, 
and he will cover the earth with his glory. And he will gather in all the righteous fruit of the earth. And those who have died in, in times past, all the dead from all generations will be resurrected. The fruit of the earth will be gathered into the kingdom of God. And all the uh, stubble, all the chaff, the wicked will be removed from the earth and burnt in fire because it's the harvest is the end of the age. And at that time when Jesus returns, just before, it says he will trample out um, the, gra the grapes. Uh, the armies of Armageddon will be trampled by him, just like grapes in, in the grape vat. And he will gather in that final harvest. It will be a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles as the harvest of the earth is gathered in, praise God. And then he will fill the earth with his glory. And so Jesus will fulfills all the feasts. He's already fulfilled stage one of Tabernacles because he was born at Tabernacles. And if we accept him, Tabernacles is fulfilled in us. I'm going to share more on the Feast of Tabernacles next week because there's a lot more exciting things I want to share with you. But I want you to realize that you can rejoice. You can rejoice that the Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled in you because the Spirit of God lives in you. Praise God. You can rejoice that you are united to God forever. And you can rejoice in the future fulfillment of tabernacles, that one day you won't just have a tent, you will have a temple, a permanent building of God that, that will be eternally flooded with the glory of God. Hallelujah. And one day soon, Jesus will return at the Feast of Tabernacles and establish his glorious kingdom upon the earth. Praise God for the Feast of Tabernacles. So do check back next week, and I want to share you a lot of wonderful things connected to the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to introduce you to my healing package. There's a book called Getting Healed, which gives you guidance as to step by step as how to receive your healing. But the other side of healing is health and having a long life. And so my other book is Keys to Long Life. We need to know God's promises concerning long life so that we can fulfill God's purpose for our life. Normally these would be uh, $9.99 and £8. But I'm offering them both together today for £15. I also have CD series that cover the, the material in these books. Normally £20 each for eight CDs. And so Getting Healed and also Long Life, you can have them for £15 each. If you will write a check to Derek Walker, 363 Banbury Road, Oxford, OX2 7PL, or phone the church office, 01865 515 086.